include and are listed here um, include sexual and gender-based violence that um, affect to a large extent and are specifically targeted towards women, but also affect men in eventually a very different scope. Um, then there we have a forced migration that affects um, women and children uh, in particular, but also we have issues such as uh, maternal mortality that is an average like 2.5 to uh, 2 times higher in conflict and post-conflict. Also the, the age of early marriage, um, and here I listed an example from um, Syrian refugees in Jordan, that is a lot higher in armed conflict and um, than it was before the war, also due to the lack of security in particular to, to girls and women. Also, um, female voters, for example, are four times more likely as men to be targeted by intimidation in elections in fragile states. So there are different aspects that also affect, for example, like education, um, reproductive health issues, security, political participation that go through all dimensions of life that affect men and women differently and in, and in peacetime and, and particularly um, during times of armed conflict. Um, we can go over to the next slide, please. Um, due to these gendered impacts of armed conflict, um, there is a particular need or the need emerged to have like, and to develop um, a normative framework um, on an international level that results um, from the recognition that there are differences between the effect on women or men and the different effects on different ages and different groups within society. Um, during the 20th century, there has been a major shift from the perception and the conceptual framing of what we mean by security from state security, meaning the protection of borders and the nation state, towards a more human security approach that came together with the human development um, concept that focuses not only on the protection of state institutions and state borders, but much rather on um, individuals and citizens and includes a lot deeper understanding of what we mean by sustainable or positive peace, which is um, a concept beyond the absence of armed conflict, but we mean that people truly can live a life where they can safely participate in our societies and be a productive member of the development and creation of our societies, include like in an inclusive manner, meaning with no discrimination against neither women nor men nor people from different backgrounds, um, be it ethnical or religious um, or from, from another nature. These shift in concepts then results in different approaches to how we see, understand and implement peacemaking, peacekeeping and peace building, meaning how we um, how the international community intervenes in um, areas affected by armed conflict, but also how civil society has been um, and is approaching peace building issues, um, continuously trying to be more inclusive and not only looking at stopping the, the armed conflict and the the armed violence, but also looking towards an, a peace that is more sustainable for everyone, and that results into an increased engagement of the possibly potentially vulnerable populations or less visible populations within the situation of armed conflicts, um, such as for example, like the involvement and active involvement of women and civil societies working on gender issues. The next slide, please. Because in concrete. Um, um, the next slide will outline the normative framework in particular, including the Uni United Nations Charter and human rights law, including the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that exists since like right after World War II. Um, then the CEDAW Convention that exists, like, that has been come into place in 1979. Um, and focuses on um, which is the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women and has very concrete provisions on um, women's rights as being perceived as human rights um, and builds the women rights framework, so to speak. And then the Beijing Platform of Action, which includes a critical area E, focuses um, on different levels of uh, women's empowerment at different stages and the platform E um, focuses on women's need and opportunities and during times of armed conflict. 
it still like it also it serves us as a um, very concrete um, policy suggestions how to put um, provisions on how to, to protect and promote women's rights and how to put it into practice on a policy level um, and has yet to be achieved. So there are a lot of provisions and therefore there have been several reviews on a five year basis, like after five years, after 10 years, um, after 15 years to review if we have reached the um, provisions within the Beijing platform and we have yet to achieve them. There's also an inclusion of a gender perspective into international humanitarian law through the um, Geneva um, Convention and um, in that, like, resulting through that in international criminal law. In particular, since the um, armed conflict in former Yugoslavia, there has been an um, inclusion in the jurisprudence of the ICTY, the International Criminal Tribunal for Former Yugoslavia, through the case of Kadic that established that gender-based crimes, meaning sexual violence, committed on a large and systematic and widespread scale, um, can be prosecuted as a war crime. Also under the ICTY um, and the ICTR, sexual and gender-based violence in armed conflict have been recognized as being a crime against humanity. And under the ICTR, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, um, it has been even recognized as a possible act of genocide. Since then, and since the establishment of the International Criminal Court, the ICC, and through the Rome Statute, there's a special recognition of not only rape being um, a possible crime against humanity or um, war crime or a genocidal act, but also <clears throat> there has been a lot larger um, definition of what sexual violence can mean, not only rape, but also sexual molestation, forced prostitution, and so forth. You find a long list and a very comprehensive definition of what these elements of crime include in um, the elements of crime list in the International Criminal Tribunal. With that, we can move to the next slide, please. So, nonetheless, we have a strong normative framework. In practice, it is still like women are largely absent from peace processes. Women are largely absent from peacekeeping missions and within peacekeeping personnel, which, if we look at the normative framework, makes it difficult to implement it and to, if we have cases, for example, of sexual and gender-based violence committed on a large scale against women, makes it difficult to actually find the evidence, to report on it, to protect the women and to give them an access to justice and to protection and health services and reintegration mechanisms in, in practice. Because law only is as good as it is um, on an implementation scale. So as we see in these statistics, and I will not go into detail, there are only 4% of the signatories between in the past almost 15 years um, to peace in agreements and in peace negotiation. That is also due to the fact that it is considered that the major conflicting parties are um, occupied by male decision maker positions. Nonetheless, especially when peace is negotiated, women have a large, large amount to say of their perceptions of what considers like what is needed to create sustainable peace. Please the next slide. Um, there, apart from the strictly speaking normative framework, there's also a strong policy development um, that has happened in the last 15 years and I've listed a couple of resolutions. There's a Namibia plan of action that was in 2000 that particularly focuses on peacekeeping mission and the inclusion of women and the gender dimension in UN peacekeeping operations. And then um, 16 years ago, 15 and a half years ago, the establishment um, and the adoption of resolution 1325 really not changed a bit the policy framing and the language how on an international level we include and perceive women's involvement. It particularly targets or let's say addresses the participation of women in peace processes, the protection and prevention of sexual and gender based violence and um, like in times of armed conflicts and the inclusion of a gender perspective in a policy level when it comes to peacekeeping and peace building. Following 
Resolution 1325, Resolution 1820, 1888, 1889, that followed in 2008, 2009, and Resolution in 1960 and 2010, focus um, even beyond, let's say, the, the focus on women, but also include the protection of civilians in armed conflict from sexual and gender-based violence. And, the, and establish the um, position of an international rapporteur, a uh, special rapporteur on sexual and gender-based violence at um, the UN level. And um, that really enabled the UN to more comprehensively report on sexual and gender-based violence in armed conflict. Um, now, 15 years later, like the policy involvement that 1325 has triggered 15 years ago, um, expanded in terms of language and it is like the importance of the following resolution even though they repeat and strengthen what 1325 had established the language has changed a lot it changed from um, let's say the resolution or uh, suggests or encourages member states um, towards a lot stronger um, language if, if you look at the vocabulary um, now the most recent resolution that was adopted last year in October at the open debate um, in, for, on Resolution 1325's review, um, Resolution 2042, um, in particular focuses on the inclusion, not only on the further inclusion of women in leadership positions in the uh, international and UN organizations and in, in the international policy, framework, but also in particular on including um, women and women in decision-making position in um, counter-terrorism strategies. And I wanted to reach, uh, read out to you briefly um, paragraph 13 from this resolution 20, um, 2242, uh, where it urges member states and the United Nations system to ensure the participation and leadership of women and women's organization in the development in, in developing strategies to counter terrorism and violent extremism, which can be conducive to terrorism, including through countering, incitement, and commit terrorist acts, creating counter narratives and other appropriate interventions, and building their capacity to do so effectively to further address, and further address, including by the empowerment of women, youth, religious, and cultural leaders, and so on. So it really puts a strong responsibility on not only on the United Nations system, but also on member states to strengthen women's organization and to ensure a leadership of women within, um, within counter-terrorism um, strategies and that respond or should be able to respond and equipped to respond to violent extremism. So it is a resolution that is not only talking about armed conflict in a very general way, but in a very, like, addresses terrorist acts and extremism in, in a very particular manner. So, as you can see, Resolution 1325 is still probably the most cited Women, Peace and Security resolution and um, a starting point. But the other development of the resolutions have fine-tuned the need and the possible and needed action to respond to gendered insecurities of armed conflict. Next slide, please. Um, of course, and again, a policy framework is only as good as the implementation and as the possibility to, to reinforce it. So, in terms of implementation, there's a review by the Secretary General e, like, that looks at women, peace, and security issues. And there's one on um, sexual and gender-based violence in armed conflict as well that collects data and gives us an overview. And you can look them all up in, um, on the UN website. An overview of the data that is available to the UN on women, peace, and security issues that involves um, the particular crimes or insecurities that women are facing during armed conflict. Um, but also the leader, like women's representation and leadership position when it comes to peace and security issue. There's an annual review of Resolution 1325 by the General Assembly each October. Then there's a special rapporteur um, that reports on sexual violence and armed conflict. At the country level where the UN system is working, there's a so-called, um, the, there's a, um, the, the development framework on our peacekeeping missions that include um, almost 
comprehensively and almost in all countries, a gender dimension. There's a United Nations system-wide action plan on the empowerment of women, uh, UNSWAP, that ensures, or let's say, that tries to measure how and to which extent the UN agencies at different levels implement a gender perspective within their work. But also we have 52 national action plans developed by member states, by governments, um, that we have a look on at our next slide, which we can go to already. Um, with, and I wanted to mention also like this civil society engagement um, that, is, that is particularly important to support the national action planning processes, the United Nations, but also um, not only in collecting the data, but um, also in overseeing governmental work in the implementation of 1325. Nonetheless, there are an enormous, enormous amount of, of challenges, but also of successes. And here you find a list of um, national action plans that have been developed in, in the past 10 years. Um, this is a um, visual image developed by the Women's International um, League for, for Peace and Freedom. Um, <clears throat> So you see it started in 2005 and until 2008 with um, mainly European countries, the Nordic countries, but um, now in the last year, um, countries such as Afghanistan, but also um, Iraq or Gambia, Kosovo, Indonesia have developed national action plans on 1325, bringing the resolution like contextualizing it at a national level and developing specific activities and outputs and indicators that demonstrate and um, outline how to implement Resolution 1325 at the country level, ideally um, dedicating resources to implement these activities and measurable um, um, outputs and results. Nonetheless, in times of armed conflict, um, receiving the data, what is happening, contextualizing the gender dimension of um, power dynamics that are happening within violent contexts is, is extremely hard to get. And it's extremely hard to prove because data gets lost. Um, data can, like the, um, the possession of data can be um, even dangerous when it comes to, say, violent crimes or or gender gender dynamics. There's still and continuously a lack of funds and resources, a possible lack of political will um, and priority. Other issues are still considered more important than than gender issues, and there's often a hesitance to collaborate between actors. Some successes include the establishment of roundtables and um, task forces on 1325 where different actors come together, government, civil society, and so forth. And um, it often depends on individual um, commitments to develop a national action plan and put it into practice. Uh, there's one example in, from Chile where a representative from the defense ministry, a general advisor from the defense ministry without any funding, established collaboration with other actors from other ministries to develop a national action plan. But also the involvement of civil society and activists, such as in the Netherlands, where the civil society involvement has been very strong, or the women's movement in Western Africa, um, has contributed to the development of national action plans and the implementation of Resolution 1325. And constant finding and prioritizing um, women, peace, and security issues, or the, and the use of local media and language um, is very important and has been done, for example, in Liberia, where um, posters and radio shows have been developed in the local languages that, so that everyone could understand the importance of women, peace, and security issues. But also the collaboration with religious leaders and spiritual leaders, um, such as, for example, in Bosnia, is, um, can be very important. Um, I want to mention the example that in Bosnia Herzegovina, that after the the war, it was only the, it was an imam and it was the only, let's say, religious leader in the late 90s that recognized children born out of um, rape during times of war were recognized as full members of the Muslim community in Bosnia-Herzegovina um, through, through a fatwa that was um, um, announced. So that was like a particularly strong message sent to, to the children that are often forgotten that are maybe a result of violent crimes. And with this I come to my last slide um, where I only wanted to 
shortly list, but I will not go into detail to analyzing the power dynamics um, and the importance of let's say analyzing the power dynamic dynamics from a gender perspective, the promotion of gender focal points within the security and the public sector, and the capacity development that is important um, to to strengthen within and after armed conflict on gender issues for us to to strengthen everyone um, to implement Resolution 1325 to respond to gendered impact to armed conflict. Thank you very much. Uh, Ni Nicola? Yes. Thank you very much for. for the, yeah. The, sorry, I, I, is your presentation finished? Sorry. Yes, yes. I saw that I'm running a uh, bit Nicola, out of time. Nicola, thank you very much for that. So uh, really, I keep really this great presentation. Sorry if, if I have cut you. It just Julie, um, this is Nicola again. Sorry, I cannot hear you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I left the last slide for... Yes, we can hear you. Okay. okay, perfect. Yeah, I thought um, you were... Uh, I could not hear you. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity, and I wanted to give, like, the other speakers also a bit of time. So um, I leave my presentation there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. So, Thank you very much, Nicola. Uh, sorry, it was like a problem with the internet connection, so... Yes, I will, I will. So thank you very much, Nicola. Really, it wasn't a problem with the internet connection, so we had like a disconnect. So really, thanks a lot for that great, uh, great, great presentation. Uh, giving us like a great overview of the normative framework. Also very interesting to look at the evolution uh, of policy development with like stronger languages on women's rights um, and gender. And it's very insightful to see the, um, the presentation about the global uh, perspective on challenges and success. It's very inspiring. So now we are going to introduce uh, our next uh, speaker for the second uh, for the second presentation. Uh, it's uh, Mariam from INEO Politik, and Mariam uh, will share with us the result of the e discussion on the implementation of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 in the Arab states. So, Marianne, the floor is yours, and I just want to remind to all the participants that please feel free to um, share your question in the chat box uh, during, during the presentation. We are uh, recording them, we are taking note of them to, to use them at the, at the end of the webinar for the Q&A uh, section. And also, please feel free to use the icon on, uh, to upload our speaker if you are happy with the presentation. Marianne, the floor is yours. Hello. Thank you, Saria. Can uh, can everyone hear me? I'm guessing yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Nicola, for such an insightful presentation, and thank you, Saria and Julie and Oxfam for the opportunity uh, to speak in this webinar. So please let me know by chat if I'm speaking too fast because I tend to do that when I'm excited about something. Um, so my name is Miriam Trabelsi, and I work with Inopolitics. Uh, what is Inopolitics? Uh, maybe some of you don't know. Hopefully not that many. Uh, next slide, please, Sarah. Um, so I know politics is 
um, a platform. It's a, it's, first of all, it's a joint project between uh, five partners, the International IDEA, the Interparliamentary Union, the National Democratic Institute, uh, UNDP, and UN Women. Uh, so we aspire to be an online knowledge hub, kind of a one-stop shop on women's political participation. Uh, and our goal is to equip women with tools and resources to increase their, their political participation and to facilitate knowledge sharing and exchange of experience and practice um, to generate more knowledge. Um, and our audiences is mostly women in politics or women and men who want to see more women in politics or uh, academia experts. Uh, researchers or anyone actually. Uh, next slide please. Um, so I'm going to show you how the website looks like. Uh, the website is available in four languages. On the upper left corner you can see the little circles. If you click on the Spanish or Arabic or French or English you'll get the, the other version of the website. Um, on the top if you click on learn you get access to a very um, big library of resources. Resources can go from interviews, uh, news, training guides, uh, webinars, uh, online courses, um, and so on and so forth. On the upper right corner, you can see that some of the resources we have are also e-discussions, and we recently closed one on the implementation of uh, the United Nations Security Council 1325 in the um, Arab states, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, at the bottom of the page, I couldn't capture that in the screenshot, but you can also uh, search uh, resources by country or region. So there's a map and you can click on a given country and then you get all the resources we have on that country. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Saria. So uh, our main strength is the library we have. We have thousands of resources, like I said, on different countries and on many uh, different themes. For example, right now, uh, our in-focus themes are the women, peace, and security, and um, representatives in parliaments. Um, next slide, please. So now, like Saria said, uh, I'm I'm not an expert in the women, peace, and security agenda. I don't pretend to be. I'm just uh, here to present you the outcome of the e-discussion that we recently closed on the implementation of 1325 in the Arab states. Um, so very briefly, I my so very briefly here are the the findings. So many experts and practitioners uh, joined the discussion over a period of uh, five weeks. For example, contributors include the Assistant Secretary General of the League of Arab States, Dr. Haifa Abu Ghazela, uh, the lead author of the UN Global Study on Resolution 1325, Mrs. Radhika Kumaraswamy, as well as civil society activists from the Iraqi Women Network, uh, for example and also the Jordanian National Commission for Women, in addition to many policy uh, specialists from UN Women, uh, Women, Peace and Security section in New York and the regional office in Cairo and also the country office um, in Jordan. So the contributions are very extensive, so I cannot cover all of the things that were mentioned here. Um, I hope, however, that I'll get you enough interested and curious so you go and read all of the answers on our website. Um, so on the implementation, on the implementation gaps and challenges, um, Saria, next slide, please. And those are the questions, sorry, uh, those were the questions that were put on the website to guide the contributors and their answers uh, to the e-discussion. So on the implementation gaps and challenges, um, Radhika Kumaraswamy, the lead author of the global study, uh, said that the global study makes clear that now strong normative frameworks are in place for women, peace and security, and what is missing is political will and financing for implementation of these frameworks. Uh, women involved in political decision making um, can help to change the attitudes of their governments about the global priorities for peace and security. Respondents also, um, they agree that one of the most significant obstacles to the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda is the lack of financing. Uh, very few national action plans have dedicated budgets and even fewer have funding directly from the government in question. Um, another big challenge is the attitude of states towards Resolution 1325. Uh, for example, if country X is not in conflict, um, it thinks it does not need a nap. Um, the perception that 1325 
applies only to countries in conflict is slowly changing, but requires continued advocacy, which should, civil society can help with. Um, another major challenge is the traditional relationship or non-relationship uh, between government and civil society, and more specifically, engagement with women as equal and valued representatives of civil society. Although there have been significant efforts from UN Women and the special envoys in Yemen and Syria, for example, the actual engagement by the governments with the women has been kind of disappointing, according to our respondents again. Um, here's, an, here's an example given by Basma Al Khatib from the Iraqi Women Network, which is a network of 80 civil society organizations specialized in women, peace, and security in Iraq. So according to her, um, even though that the Iraqi NAP, which is, by the way, um, one of the, so respondents said that in the region, there's, some respondents said that there's one official national action plan, which is in, in Iraq. Some others said that in Iraq and Palestine, and there's also discussion about one that's supposed to come up at the end of 2016 in Jordan. Uh, but the only, the sure information is that the only official one um, is, is in Iraq. So according to Basma al Khatib, um, even though there is an Iraqi NAV, and that NAP was developed by a multi-sectoral working group with representatives from various spheres of the Iraqi society, including government and civil society, private sector, and academia. Uh, the government failed to consult with, the, with this working group um, when revising the plan at a later time, as it made amendments and deleted many provisions that were agreed upon by the group. Um, in addition to this, it was, it was also observed um, that the adopted plan lacked statistical indicators demonstrating the escalating violence. Uh, also, the Iraqi NAB did not include Resolution 1820 on the criminalization of sexual violence as a means of warfare. It also did not include the list of Resolution 1325 recommendations adopted by the Security Council. Um, next slide, please. So for the effective implementation um, of Resolution 1325, work should be done on two levels, according to our respondents, the policy and the grassroots level. Uh, for the policy level, and on the question we asked in the e-discussion about what parliaments can do uh, to advance this agenda, respondents agree that what is essential is that there are both men and women MPs willing to promote the women, peace, and security agenda. Um, this is not a gender agenda, but a national human rights agenda that must be owned by all duty bearers, particularly in patriarchal societies such as those dominating in the MENA region. Um, it is critical to have a ma male as well as female champions of the cause, as women in government are sometimes placeholders for men rather than independent actors. Uh, also, it is important to recognize that while there are many women who are activists for gender equality and women empowerment, there are also many who are more traditional um, and do not promote the same agenda. Similarly, not all men are opposed to gender equality. Uh, for the grassroots level, um, civil society organizations and women machineries are instrumental as they have the leverage in reaching out for the wider and diversified population. Um, civil society and women's organizations have played a key role in the region in pushing the agenda, according to our respondents again, um, promoting the role of women in peace processes and raising awareness overall of the impacts of conflict on women and girls. Um, on the issue of national action plans, why creating a NAP is a key step in advancing the women, peace, and security agenda, um, our colleagues from Jordan um, said that there is the, um, there are other concrete measures that can be undertaken uh, to further the agenda while the adoption of the NAP is pending, like it is the case uh, in Jordan. Um, so, for example, in Jordan, UN Women is partnering with Jordan's national security uh, protection actors through the provision of gender and protection related training to ensure they are better equipped to tackle and address issues of sexual and gender based violence both domestically and in their peace and security work internationally. Uh, next slide, please. So that was a very brief overview of the outcome of the e-discussion. Uh, um, I wanted to 
make the time that was allocated. Uh, so please, if you're interested in this subject, I invite you to go to the I Know Politics website and read um, the respondent uh, answers. And also, we're um, at the moment drafting kind of a consolidated reply that will be posted by next week. Um, that will show all of the results in one uh, nice piece. Um, and also, so this week, we also launched another e-discussion on I Know Politics on parliamentary oversight um, on gender equality. It will run also for five uh, weeks until the 28th of February. Next slide, please. Um, so if, if you are parliamentarians or if you work on parliaments and gender equality, I invite you uh, and I encourage you to participate. Uh, and please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, as we always have updates. Thank you so much, Sari and Julie. The floor is yours. Thank you, Miriam, for, for this insightful presentation. Uh, it was great. Uh, please, everybody, feel free to click on the uh, emoticon uh, feature and uh, and express your emotions by a smiley face, by applauding, uh, approval, confusion, hopefully not. <laughs> OK, uh, so we will now be moving on to our last presentation given by Akram and Wazma. Unfortunately, as Wazma will not be able to join us due to internet connection problems, so uh, we will now give the floor to Akram from Oxfam, Afghanistan. Over to you, Akram. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Akram, uh, and I'm joining from uh, Oxfam, Afghanistan. And I hope that you can hear me clearly. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Uh, as it is uh, said, I just feel uh, very briefly. Unfortunately, my colleague um, uh, was Mafro, who was, is the director of the uh, Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, could not join us. So I am uh, trying to cover um, some of her um, uh, points as well here. As, uh, as you um, uh, can see, I um, will share the case study of Afghanistan that what, um, uh, because we have developed the National Action Plan of 2025, uh, just this July, that is six, month, is six months uh, old. And um, I will get through a brief um, introduction, so or a brief background that uh, uh, Afghanistan after the collapse of um, Taliban regime, it was a uh, uh, started the woman empowerment and normal capacity building from scratch. So um, the education uh, woman was allowed to go to school, and we have been. Um, uh, uh, the right have been uh, incorporated in some of the laws and policies of Afghanistan government, especially the Afghanistan constitution. So there is some provision in Afghanistan constitution that um, both women and men are equal uh, before the law, and the women can um, are allowed to go for work, for education, and. Uh, uh, working uh, and uh, access to uh, health um, uh, services. Uh, so that was also the basis for the NAPLET in 25. The CEDA convention that had come so have been joined since 2003. So um, after the collapse of uh, the Taliban regime and uh, uh, the draft of new uh, uh, constitution of Afghanistan. Also, the government and with the help of international um, community have been developing an Afghan national um, development strategy that they also incorporated the um, one section just for women empowerment, women inclusion, and also some um, uh, 
their uh, needs and their concerns also have been included there and the, there is some provision that uh, each um, ministry should uh, uh, focus on that areas. Uh, the other is also in 2008 um, the National Action Plan for Women of Afghanistan or what we call MAPPON also had been drafted and it was ratified so uh, they have some, it has some, um, it has some, uh, um, uh, some strategies included there that um, uh, uh, five uh, different category have been um, identified here that needs more improvement for uh, to improve the livelihood and also the um, condition of women in Afghanistan, especially uh, provision for their prevention of gender-based violence, the equality and inclusiveness also included here. So it will expire 2018, so it was for 10 years. There is an evil law also enacted in 2009 for a presidential decree, uh, but it was a huge controversial in, in this traditional society that uh, some of the parliament members were also against it and they did not want to ratify that. So that was the problem and um, uh, uh, now it has a, a huge evil law because it criminalized some of the gender-based violence or violence against women, some of the, um, uh, con uh, uh, this uh, uh, traditional uh, uh, people uh, do not like uh, this uh, because they, they want to say that this is against Islam and against our tradition. The NAP 1325 also is a very broad, I mean they have included many different uh, categories such as uh, participation, prevention, and promotion, also the recovery. So uh, different uh, pillars of uh, UN, uh, um, UN, uh, United Nations uh, Council of Resolution also have been included here. Uh, so that is a, a bigger, um, very big um, national action plan that should, needs to be reviewed and also narrowed down. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, the political participation also did, you know, for example, um, if I go to the, some facts and figures, for example, we have 25 percent quota for um, women political uh, for women uh, participation in uh, provincial councils and also in parliament of Afghanistan. But now uh, we have 28 to 29 percent, so it is more than the quota. It is. Uh, a uh, very good um, achievement because of uh, it is um, the highest uh, in the in this region of the world. Also, the security sector. It is um, uh, the the government wanted to increase the female police from um, uh, one percent to to five to ten percent in two years. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the, it has not been achieved uh, yet, so we are in the middle way, and it is uh, increasing um, very slightly. Nowadays, we have, for example, 2,500 female police in the um, police, sector, uh, 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 police sector, but uh, uh, they are, uh, many of them are not in the position of decision making. And so that was a problem. So, um, now the government has sent some of them to uh, around 400 female police to Turkey to get the, all this um, uh, capacity building trainings, and they have come back and joined the police. So that was also very good so, uh, that uh, the government have focused on this initiative as well. Uh, so, uh, women inclusion and peace process, nowadays Afghanistan is going through the peace and there is a lot of debates that is going that um, uh, the, how to bring this um, AOG or um, this arm opposition groups to bring on the negotiation table. 
but um, uh, uh, considering uh, last year, uh, Oxfam has published um, a report called Behind Closed Doors, uh, especially focused on women inclusion in peace talks. And uh, the report found out that um, found out that um, in 2023. Uh, peace um, talks, uh, women uh, had not been included in none of them. So that was um, uh, uh, produced a debate that why women was not included. But after the transition to this new government, uh, President Ghani has uh, said that uh, he would um, include the women in all stages of peace uh, and conflict resolution because the concern and the achievements of uh, women in this past years are, uh, is, uh, should be uh, safeguarded uh, and also women should be included in the uh, local level and conflict resolution at local levels. So some pro uh, many NGOs are um, running programs to include, for example, women in uh, peace bureaus and conflict resolution and Oxfam also have uh, one or two programs uh, working in that issue. Uh, there is APRP, what is called Afghanistan Peace and Reconciliation Program, also um, have a gender perspective there to include more women in the uh, peace process um, so that the uh, concerns and the needs of uh, women at the local level could be heard and could be reflected uh, properly. Uh, uh, unfortunately, um, there is uh, the gender-based violence or the sexual violence against uh, women has increased in the past years. So there is many factors that we can add to it. For example, maybe the uh, woman got the encouragement to bring in and, and um, uh, uh, report the cases, and that is because more women are willing to uh, to speak about that. That is because of that is falling. And there is other uh, violence as well that we can have. For example, there is many the OEG are uh, um, committing a lot of this. Uh, um, uh, their own justice system, so that was also a problem. Okay, next slide, please. So the EVA law, as I mentioned, that is a lot of um, back, uh, uh, a lot of um, feedbacks um, from the traditional society and con uh, um, this conservative people that they do want and find it against the. Uh, religion or against Islam and also the tradition of society. Not what is going on, but the implementation is a little bit um, problematic. It was not uh, very fully uh, implemented and the political will is also a little bit and the capacity is a little bit weak so that to uh, implement the NAPWA uh, probably, and also the NAPWA is uh, very broad and uh, include every segment, every part of the, uh, a lot of themes and a lot of topics, so that was a lot of problematic uh, to include it, and also the monitoring of that uh, NAPWA is a lot, a huge problem, there is not a lot of um, data available to, to monitor or to quantify this, uh, the measure of the progress for the NACWA. Um, uh, so the major improvements that have happened is uh, for the women of Afghanistan is the education, also the health sector. For example, now 40% of girls are in the schools, so that is a big achievement for the government as well. So the health service and rural Afghanistan is also um, uh, improving year by year, so that is also a good um, work. So as it is mentioned here and as you can see is that uh, uh, and there is a lot of policies and uh, laws um, uh, drafted and um, enacted, uh, but the capacity of Afghanistan, and especially this fragile, uh, fragile context that we are in, prevent to implement this. And uh, from one hand, the government doesn't have the capacity to do that, and they are, um, or the political will is not here. And there are other uh, hands that. Um, 
uh, 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 the, the, um, the conservative or non uh, state actors or very much in power that they stand against this uh, kind of policies of change, especially in favor of women. And next slide, please. So, uh, um, uh, as I mentioned, Bayan is uh, means the um, uh, express yourself or expression. So that is a program. It's a consistent program. So it is uh, much more focusing on inclusive security, uh, mainly focusing on advocacy or raising uh, for recruitment of more formal police in the. Uh, and working with the Ministry of Interior to include and recruit more female police and promote them to higher level, um, higher uh, rankings, and also provide a safe environment for the female police, those who have uh, already joined here. So this is the main focus uh, for, for inclusive security. The other is uh, inclusive, uh, the other objective is the inclusive political participation. So more qualified and active uh, women should be uh, nominate themselves um, working on their capacity building or identifying some potential female leaders so that they could and help them uh, to to nominate themselves for the next year uh, parliamentary elections and also for the provincial councils uh, also advocating on uh, with the, the governments that they could also uh, decision provide them for the decision making process. Uh, so also, the more women should be um, uh, included in peace talks, especially that now the peace talk is in uh, going on, and there are as many meetings as that's going on. So more women should be included there, and um, uh, we are also advocating for that as well. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, as I mentioned, that is the fragility context analysis is um, should be considered while the drafting this um, map 1325 because uh, the the government or because of the they didn't have the capacity or the uh, the political will is not there, so it is a uh, very much difficult uh, to prioritize. The gender aspect or the gender responsive uh, policies there in the, uh, in the agenda of um, uh, 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 the government. So that is um, uh, uh, while drafting this NAP um, uh, part for the other countries, I mean, this is a good thing that uh, we should also uh, focus that how, can, how far can it go. For example, Afghanistan has a lot of policies, but uh, the implementation is not uh, there, so uh, uh, is not going very well. Uh, there is a huge non state actors in Afghanistan that uh, wanted to stand against these uh, changes. So awareness raising and working with um, um, uh, educated youth, especially for example in Afghanistan, in, in Bayan program, you are working with educated youth so that uh, changing their attitudes towards in favor towards uh, in favor of um, women rights and also linking different levels of uh, local level national level and also some uh, activities at international uh, level so that uh, the the learning and the concerns should be reflected properly um, Afghanistan now is a has a unity government uh, but this unity government has a lot of problems. It, um, uh, they are in transition. Now we do not have the, the cabinet is not here. So there is a lot of problem with this unity government. So that um, the, so it means that uh, the gender aspect and the NAP and other policies are um, deprioritized and other security and uh, the uh, discussion uh, between these two leaders is going on, so that is the problem for Afghanistan and um, 
uh, the security challenges, as uh, you might hear in the news, that different parts of the Afghanistan is uh, the insurgent group is so um, very active. Um, and also the, the, the civil society organization are uh, concerned about the drawbacks of the achievements that they have got um, um, uh, achieved in the past uh, one and a half decades uh, in Afghanistan after the Taliban. So thank you for your um, attention. If there is um, any uh, question, uh, I would be happy to answer in the Q&A session. Thank you, Akram, for your presentation. Thank you. Um, we will now open up uh, the Q&A, but before we do that, let's um, give a round of applause. So please click on your smiley and click on the applause button, just like I'm doing now, if you can please do so with me, so that we can, yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody, so that we can thank our speakers. So um, thank you, uh, Nicola, thank you, Miriam, and thank you, Akram, for your presentations. We will now be moving to the Q&A session that will be facilitated by Julie. Over to you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you very much again to all of you and thank you, Faria. So now we have uh, approximately between 15 and 20 minutes to have uh, a Q&A. So um, please feel free to uh, send all your uh, questions on the chat box because we will not be opening the mic. So I see people raising their hands. So it would be really good if you can um, put your question on the chat box because Faria and myself, you are taking note of the questions. We have uh, so far two um, two questions. Uh, one of them, two, two of them, this, uh, for Nicola. The first one, Nicola. It's one of the question is why so much emphasis on gender-based violence in UN resolution on women, peace, and security. So this is one of like, the first question. Another question, which is a big one, so I hope that uh, Nicola, Miriam, and Akram, you can uh, all um, give, your, give your perspective on that one. It's about sharing experiences and examples about what have been tried, tested, and worked in terms of closing the implement implementation gap uh, of uh, 1325. So this is a big one. Um, and another one, this is my question uh, to Mariam. Uh, I don't know if there is any um, concrete example or initiative uh, in the Arab states um, linking uh, civil society organization to a national government in relation to women, peace, and security. So I don't know if there is any um, specific example of good practices of linking civil society organization and women rights organization in particular um, to discuss uh, women, peace, and security with, uh, nation with the national government. So Nicola, over to you. Uh, to reply to the, fir to the two first questions. So why so much emphasis on gender-based violence in UN resolution on women, peace, and security, and experience and example uh, to close the implementation gap of 1325? Thank you very much, Julie. Um, I meant to ask like, the first question, maybe like why is there so um, much emphasis on, on I understand, GBV, gender-based violence, in the 1325 framework? Um, I think it comes from the, the let's say, well, first of all, that we have to contextualize the, the policy development and the legal development in a system that we lived in and that we do, we continue to live in and that we lived in, in the, like, in, let's say, in the 
in the 20th century, which is a system of patriarchy. And um, then in the 90s, like women's issues and women's participation was not considered as an important issue. Um, but a secondary, sexual and gender-based violence was considered a byproduct of war, such as, let's say, looting or stealing um, and other crimes. It was not considered a central issue and it was not considered a, a threat to security. So that has changed in the 90s because there was such an over-reporting for the first time on sexual violence that have, where women have been targeted, um, not as it's say, and it could not be denied like that it is not a side product, but it was a weapon of armed conflict. It was a political strategy to expel a certain population, um, the Bosnian and the uh, Croat and also the Serbian part of the population, depending on, on which side you look at, but from a specific territory. And sexual violence was used to deter the population, to um, to make a population move. So, or in, in the case of Rwanda, to, um, to extinct uh, a certain population, the Tutsi. Um, how do we know that? It's how these acts of violence were accompanied with statements, with um, symbols, how they were committed. So it was that then, the, let's say, on an international level, there was no way around on paying that kind of attention. And resulting from that point, that the recognition that sexual violence against women is actually an act, or it has been used as an act of warfare, within these two armed conflicts in the late um, 90s, came a whole lot of more importance to, um, let's say, women's participation. It has been important, like, also during, let's say, Beijing. But before that, I think because it was such um, a huge crime, or it was suddenly considered within the system we live in as um, a central importance to or a central threat to security, it's because it still carries on to be like, to play such a central part. It doesn't mean that now women's participation within the security sector reform, like, or within the security sector, um, women being judges or women's right to, to vote or to run for political offices, also in terms of armed conflicts, or the importance of women's voices and how to create sustainable peace. All these issues are not less important. I just think that um, the whole de the policy development and it continues to um, be much more recognized as an urgency and an important issue by decision makers. Um, I think this is why there is such an, a strong focus on it. Nonetheless, also, um, this type of violence and, for, and especially the perception of insecurity because of the existence of such violence paralyzes women as being actors and providers of, like, productive providers of a household, especially when they have to um, manage them by their own. So not only that these acts are um, destroying women's lives, and not only women's lives, but the lives of families and micro-social structures, but also being aware that this violence can happen to you as a woman in this targeted manner because you are a woman and because you may represent a certain ethnicity or race or religious group, um, you will be attacked because you, you belong to that group and you are a woman in that way. And also because you could be attacked in that way because you're a woman and you don't comply with what is expected from you. So these, knowing this is like um, a very, very strong um, impact, like has a lot of a very strong impact on other dimensions of life. So I think this is why it continues to come up and there is a continues to such you know, such a strong focus within the 1325 policy framework. Um, I don't know, I, I hope I answered the question and please I want to invite also the other speakers and also the participants to add or if you have different opinions or perceptions on, on, on that first question. And the second was like what experience have been tested and tried in implementing 1325 and what has worked? And that's indeed a very, <laughs> a very big question because of course there have been like a lot of things tried in the scope of implementing Resolution 1325. There are lots of lessons learned and there are some good practices that are summarized in some publications. Generally, um, there have, has been tried to develop action plans without any resources, for example, um, that works, that has worked in a certain way, but works, of course, a lot less than any activity or any project 
you want to develop and you have resources for it. You have people who are committed and you have um, either financial or other resources that you can work with than a um, project or action plan where you don't have that. Um, what other has been tested and tried is like forms of co collaborations that have been either fruitful or have been problematic in different contexts. I think that generally all sorts of collaborations between different actors is important and fruitful to make women peace security issues last because both gender and peace and security are cross-cutting issues that affect uh, almost all actors of society from different angles. So it's important to get like a large variety of actors together to discuss and to come to an agreement of priorities and what activities need to be done in a specific context. But that is of course like also very, can be very paralyzing, especially in post-conflict situations and can like prolong the process. But these are only two examples and I think maybe I can, like there's a, a global study that um, Young Women has published that raises a lot of examples and also if there has been a lot of civil society documentation on what has been tested and done and what has worked and what is not. Um, for example, by the Global Network of Women Peace Builders, they have done um, several monitoring reports on, um, from a civil society perspective from a variety of countries where civil society organizations from the countries have reported what has been tested and tried and what has worked and what has not. So um, I think I leave it at, at that for now. And um, yeah, I'm curious to other comments and questions. Thank you. Thanks, Colette Nicola, for the, <laughs> the very uh, elaborated uh, response for the two questions. So thank you very much. So um, we have another big question, and that one I think it's more um, addressed to uh, Miriam. Miriam, one of the questions is about that. Uh, Conflicts happen for so many reasons, for, for many, many reasons, uh, poverty growing, uh, there is a struggle for control of our resource, of our uh, power. And so one of the questions is like, does a focus on women, peace and security uh, in the MENA region a risk, create a risk of focusing more on the symptoms uh, rather than to the root cause of the Problem. So why that the, the conflict happens? So more focusing. So it it could be a risk of focusing more on the um, symptoms and not on the root cause of the problem, such as looking at the governance systems, uh, looking at the struggle between a power holder to make sure that they keep their own power. So this is one of the um, one of the questions. So Miriam, can you could you please share with us what um, what is your view on that? Okay, thank you, Jody, for that um, great question. It's a very big question, and I think it's beyond my expertise uh, because we are touching upon a huge problem in the region, which is governance and democracy building. And as we know, uh, the region is going through very tough times, and um, it's not new. Uh, but I think that the Women, Peace, and Security agenda kind of touches on that. But it, like we said, it focuses. Um, on women, peace, and security. So I, I don't know what I can answer because I think it's many, many, many um, reasons uh, that lead to these consequences. But I can answer your question about civil society and government. Um, again, based on the responses that we got um, on the e-discussion. So like I mentioned earlier, uh, there are, I'm going to be careful with words, kind of activities to advance the women, peace, and security agenda in three countries in the Arab region, as mentioned in the responses. Those are Iraq, Palestine, and, um, and Jordan. Uh, Iraq is the one that has an official um, national action plan that the government adopted. Uh, we didn't have any responses from Palestine, so I cannot really talk about that. Um, so to go back to the Iraq example, like I said, a civil society activist uh, responded and said that uh, in the drafting process, um, the government of Kurdistan and the government of the central government of Iraq put together a multi-sectoral group with civil society, private sector, academia, with uh, many stakeholders. 
and everyone uh, participated in the um, in the draft of the NAP, so th that is good. Uh, that is a good practice. Um, but the downfall of this is that, like Basma al-Khatib criticized, she said that the government uh, later failed to kind of commit to uh, all of the decisions that were taken by the by the working group as the government made amended, uh, amendments um, without, consulta without consulting uh, that group again. Uh, so that is a downfall that could be linked also to the problem of governance. Um, um, so it's a bigger problem. It's more of kind of um, rooting democratic values in, um, in governance in general. Um, about the Jordan uh, example, um, so the National Commission for Jordanian Women, um, it's an organization, they um, took on the responsibility to draft the National Action Plan. Um, as I understand it, it's not completely an NGO, but it's not completely a government organization either. Um, so they drafted the National Action Plan and submitted it to the government of Jordan for review. Um, the reviewing process has taken three years, um, and the National Commission for Jordanian Women has not heard back from the government uh, yet. So they are kind of um, making more efforts to draft another national action plan, and they're kind of doubling their advocacy efforts to kind of uh, sensitive, uh, sensible, uh, sensibilize the, um, the government to this issue. Uh, also, many respondents said that there's a big problem of awareness about this agenda. Uh, like I said earlier, if a country is not in conflict, they think that they don't need an app. Um, so that's why civil society is needed in um, in advocacy to advance the agenda. And there's lots of um, examples across the region. Um, uh, there there were some examples also given. Um, they said that to so the woman peace and security agenda is not a one size fits all. It needs to be uh, kind of modeled. Uh, based on the particularities of the of the country, um, some examples were given. Like for example, this was done in Sierra Leone, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, where there was a localization uh, of the NAP kind of to advance the um, the agenda. Um, so, for example, they in Jordan, they're kind of using this best practice, and they said that uh, the National Commission for Jordanian Women is gonna um, conduct consultations um, to build more partnerships from other groups um, that will participate in the implementation of the NAB because clearly there's something that failed in their fir first draft that took three years for reviewing. So now in the new draft, uh, they're going to include more groups and um, they're conducting a nationwide consultation uh, activity. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, Thanks. Thank you very much, Miriam. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it, it, it gives us some, some part of the, on the answer. So thank, thank you very much. Um, being conscious of the time, we, we have uh, approximately 10 minutes. So we would like to have uh, our last question to Akram. Uh, so, Akram, we would like to know a little bit more about the, the activities that was be done at community level in relation to women, peace and security, and also if you, through the Bayan program, if there was any experience of working with uh, Afghani women human rights defenders. So, Akram, if you, if you could uh, reply to those questions and being, and sorry to, uh, for asking that, but being concise because we have only eight minutes left. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, on the first question, uh, yeah, there are many initiatives going on um, uh, for the involvement of women, uh, rural women in the women peace and security. So there is, um, as I mentioned, the uh, APRP, the Afghan Peace uh, and Reconciliation uh, Program that is going on. Uh, I think it is funded by UNDP. Uh, so that is a big project and also a long-term uh, program that involving women surahs and some uh, 
uh, advocacy groups uh, in or, uh, and it has also a gender perspective as well so that is um, uh, to include women showers and women perspectives uh, and also building some of the capacity uh, for um, uh, for uh, um, uh, for conflict resolution, for women, to, uh, for the conflict resolution. And uh, uh, also, for example, Oxfam have also implemented two, three projects working with uh, women sureurs, building their capacity, their confidence, and also involving them in the informal justice system, such as uh, um, involving them in the conflict resolution on land, water, or especially on domestic violence, because the woman is uh, uh, are um, trusting women more than the men, and they can go freely to women show us. And there is many examples that they have um, caught the cases and solved the cases and negotiated in favor of women and the, the cases that there was um, the family violence or um, uh, violence against women, so that uh, 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 we have facilitated uh, so that the human uh, rights and the woman rights and also the constitutional law of Afghanistan also should be respected in their judgment and their um, and mediation and uh, negotiation at local level. This sure. A woman um, should be properly monitored, should be properly mentored uh, to register the case and to solve the cases and how they can do that. So in serious cases, they can uh, uh, refer uh, the cases to the uh, formal justice system. Uh, for the uh, uh, we have uh, to um, work with uh, existing. Um, uh, women showers and also we have uh, put some mechanisms there so that uh, women could uh, come together and especially focus on women uh, problems and uh, bringing their uh, concerns there as well. Uh, on the second questions that um, uh, any experience with the um, uh, women right, uh, human rights defenders uh, yeah, we are working to do the women organizations. There are many human rights defenders, uh, human rights um, activists, and human rights activists that we are working about at the national level and uh, local levels. Uh, so through partnership with our partners, and um, because our partners mainly the women organization, especially on women, peace, and security or in conflict uh, related programs. Uh, so yeah, we are also have some experience so that um, uh, their concerns and also their needs also should be uh, listened to or their voices uh, should be raised. And uh, uh, there is not a proper mechanism actually to to uh, raise their voice at the national level or advocate for them, uh, but. Uh, anyway, we, there is some um, random uh, um, uh, example that uh, that uh, we have helped some of them so that the, their uh, voices uh, would be heard um, and advocated for at the national level as well. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Akram. I hope I didn't cut you. So really, thank you very much for 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 the, the your reply. Um, so no, we have uh, so so. We, we could not address all the questions, so really sorry, sorry about that. It's a short, uh, we have only a short uh, time, um, but uh, I hope you found, uh, you found the discussion interesting, the presentation interesting as well. 
Um, I really want to thank you, uh, all of you who participated, but I also especially want to thank Nicola, Meriem, and uh, Akram for waking up very early and for staying really late uh, to be part of that discussion and to share your experience uh, with us. Uh, from our side, uh, the discussion was extremely interesting. Uh, we have a lot of food for thought uh, for uh, our programming and also for our influencing uh, work on women, peace and security. And we will definitely uh, reach you out, <laughs> all of you, uh, to have uh, to continue uh, to continue that um, that discussion. So really, I really thank you uh, for all of you. And I will uh, let the last word uh, to uh, Saria uh, to, 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 tell, to ask you to stay tuned. <laughs> so Saria, it's to you. OK, so thank you, Julie. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to our speakers. Uh, we will be sending, uh, as you can see now on uh, on the presentation, there are the contact details. We'll, we will be sending them to you so that you can contact them further for any questions. And um, also, uh, you can contact Julie and I for any further uh, question about webinars, about what you, what you would like uh, to uh, to listen to what you would like to discuss in our future uh, webinars, uh, part of our series. Okay, uh, we will be uh, this webinar will be uh, is rec is being recorded now and it will be interpreted into Arabic and it will be posted online. Hopefully, we will send you the links and post it on our YouTube channel. So, thank you, everybody. Uh, so I see a question now, when is the next webinar? So the next webinar hopefully will be in March. Date not set yet, but we will share this with you very, very soon. So um, it's, we're on time, hopefully. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for attending. There's just one thing I want to add. So uh, we have done a fact sheet on women, peace, and security that goes uh, along with uh, the discussion that we talked about today. So it will hopefully also be posted on Oxfam Policy and Practice, and we will send it to you also. Uh, so, uh, so thank you again for your participation and your contribution. Thanks to all the speakers, and thank you all for your time. Bye-bye. Session is over. I thank you, all of you. Bye.